There is something very strange about Elbaf. The greatest calamity facing the One Piece world is the coming Great Flood, and we've been told that with that flood will come a war for safe ground above the sea level. And the single safest island on the entire ocean is the island of Elbaf, towering high into the sky with civilizations built hundreds of meters up this vast tree, further above sea level than any other island in One Piece, completely safe from the world flooding over. So is it a coincidence that the strongest race in One Piece just so happens to already hold the safest and therefore most valuable land on the sea. Did the giants always live here at Elbaf, or did they, the strongest race, fight to claim this, the most valuable land, 800 years ago, when the world first began to sink? Why is this land known as the birthplace of war? Why is it called Warland? The true history of Elbaf is far bloodier than you realize, as if you begin to piece together all the hints of what truly happened at Elbaf, the giants become a far more sinister race. The strange connections between Elbaf and Wano suddenly become clear, and the true story of the Void Century War becomes a apparent as not just a conflict between the Ancient Kingdom and the 20 Allied Kingdoms, but rather a far more complex war that ultimately drew in all nations and races in the world and pitted them against one another in the battle for land. And most importantly, the true history of Elbaf reveals what Oda has been setting up all along for the Elbaf arc. The birthplace of war is soon to also become the center of the war that ends all wars today, Ragnarok. Today I'm going to explain to you the beginning and the end of the world wars in One Piece. But before we get into it, make sure to subscribe. But first, if you're excited for Elbaf, you can get the first Elbaf travel poster ever made for your walls today. Unlike past months, you do not need to get a full $250 bundle of travel posters to get Elbaf. You can get Elbaf individually for a major holiday sale discount. This beautiful work of art comes in both day and night versions and is made with archival ink printed on matte paper hand cut by the artist himself. And that's not all, this month we are also releasing the Skypiea and Zoe travel posters so that you can continue building your collection of all the islands of One Piece. Each of these posters can be purchased individually or you can get all three of them together at a major discount because this November we are doing $100 off the entire usual bundle from $250 to only $149. And with the bundle you will also get the Golden City Chandra for free. You can also still get the Deluxe package if you want to appear on my streams, and in that case you'll get all five posters as well. So start building your collection today with Elbath, Skypea, Zoe, and Chandra. Just hit the link in the description below. So that aside, Loki claims that Elbaf is said to be the birthplace of war, and is known as a war land, and on the surface it seems like he may simply be referencing the giant's culture of heavy emphasis on war and combat, and not actually claiming that this is the literal birthplace of war. However, it is strange that Elbaf is known to be a land defined by war when really it's nothing like actual war lands that we've seen, such as the Vodka Kingdom. The giants live in a secluded, isolated, private island, and outside of some handfuls of giants occasionally venturing out to engage in pirating activities every few centuries, it's not as though the nation of Elbaf itself is at war with other nations often. Yet the culture of war is ingrained so heavily in the giants of Elbaf and they still refer to it as a warland and the birthplace of war. Could it be that this heavy reverence for war actually stems from the origins of Elbaf, as it was a nation originally born out of a long war? Essentially, it's not known as a warland because the giants have always worshipped war, but rather perhaps the giants worship war and consider Elbaf to be Warland because the giants originally earned this island through war. Because Elbaf actually seems perfectly set up to have been the literal birthplace of the first world war in One Piece, during the Void Century. Now what we know about the Void Century War was that it was the greatest conflict the world had ever had, and it literally changed the entire planet physically. The true world of One Piece was in fact composed of vast continents prior to the Void Century, as the water levels were a lot lower in the past. However, the use of the ancient weapon, likely Uranus, began increasing the water levels with each use, till finally the entire planet flooded over. The Void Century was defined by this great flooding, as Vegapunk explains, it was a great flood that took place over the course of the century. But here's the thing, Oda has always established established what happens when flooding like this begins. There is in fact a very specific type of conflict that comes with sea levels rising. A war for safe ground. 
As land disappears and the seas flood over, higher ground becomes the most valuable resource. That is specifically established to be what is on the horizon for the One Piece world today. But the flooding that is coming today is actually nothing compared to the flooding that happened in the Void Century, where over the course of the century, the water level rose over 200 meters. This means that the war that took place in the Void Century, much like the coming war of today, was likely not only a conflict between Joy Boy and the 20 allied kingdoms, but rather the entire rest of the world would have simultaneously become embroiled in a another war, a war over safe ground, as the planet began to flood over from the use of the ancient weapons. Again, we know that has to have been the case, as again, that is clearly established to be the conflict that is coming today. The various nations will have to begin to compete for safe ground, and as the Void Century flooding took place over a far longer period of time and involved a far more extensive loss of land, logically there absolutely had to have been mass conflict across the globe, as various nations and races would have had to begun to fight to claim land as it rapidly disappeared. As the sea begins to rise and people lose land, everyone simply has to fight to claim land that is higher and higher up, with the most valuable land being land that is furthest above sea level. That is the key to everything. That is the reason why Elbaf is known as the birthplace of war. Because if we look at Elbaf, the most clear defining trait of the island, above all other islands on the Blue Sea, is its insane height. Even today, with the sea levels of the world having risen 200 meters, Elbaf still towers high into the heavens. There are entire layers of civilization extending up through the levels of the tree, still countless meters above the current sea level. To be clear, there is literally no island across all the Blues and the Grand Line remotely close to Elbaf in terms of height. Torino Kingdom technically exists, but it's actually an extremely small island that couldn't house any actual civilization. And even Torino Kingdom isn't even remotely close to Elbaf in height. To fully understand the scale of Elbaf, this is a full-size mountain range on Elbaf. And even that is minuscule compared to how high up the whole civilization scales. It seems that the giants were even able to make an entire city another several hundred meters above sea level. Meaning the entire Void Century 200 meter flood could happen all over again and Elbaf civilization would still remain untouched. So if we think about it logically, in the ancient times of the One Piece world, as the Great Flooding began and the water levels began to rise, and panic began to set in across all the world, what would have happened? Naturally, just as it has been established that people will do today, Back then, all nations, races, and people would have begun scrambling for safe ground, everyone fighting to claim higher ground as the flooding began and their own continents began to sink, with the highest possible ground being the most sought after. And so in a conflict like that, as the water level continued rising dozens and dozens of meters with no end in sight, all eyes would immediately go to the best possible safe haven first and foremost. Across the world, across all continents, there would have been one clear, undisputed, ideal option that would guarantee survival no matter how much the water levels rose, a towering, unmatched safe haven, a land attached to a gigantic tree that extended so high into the heavens that one could be safe from any flood, no matter how many hundreds of meters the water level rose. That land was Elbaf. This great tree would immediately have stood out as the obvious most valuable land to claim, and so when the race for safe ground began in the Void Century, this land that we now know as Elbaf would naturally logically have become the initial focal point of conflict, as each nation and race would flee from their own sinking lands and flock to the towering land of Elbaf for survival, and thereby find themselves in a territory war. So let's revisit this claim that Elbaf was the birthplace of war, because from everything we know about the type of war that would have come with the Void Century flooding, this actually means makes logical, literal sense. Because it sounds as though the world once lived in relative peace. There supposedly weren't even pirates before Joy Boy. Then the ancient weapons began to be used, the flooding began, water levels rose, all nations and races were forced to abdicate their sinking homelands to try to claim a new place for themselves where they could survive. As Elbaf became the first place that everyone competed over, this became the focal point of the first global territory war, and so it became known as the birthplace of war. In a once peaceful world, this tree and its land turned into an absolute bloodbath, with countless nations and races fighting each other to survive. And that fits perfectly when you consider that we were told of a tree exactly like this a long time ago. The Adam Tree. We were told of this legendary Adam Tree being a great tree that exists on an island known for a never-ending war. That's right, the Adam Tree is a great tree that is famous for having survived no matter how much war waged around it. Could that not be this very tree, the tree of Elbaf, Warland, the birthplace of war? 
After all, the only other thing that we know about the Adam tree is that it is the counterpart of the Eve tree, which is itself an absolutely impossibly vast tree that extends all the way up through the Red Line, whose roots travel all the way down to Fishman Island. The only other tree that is similarly vast and tall as the Eve tree in existence is this gigantic tree at the center of Elbaf, Warland, and again, the Adam tree is known for being at the center of a Warland. This tree is almost certainly the Adam tree, and so this would explain why there was so much war waged around the Adam tree. Why there was a seemingly never-ending war, because there once was a war that lasted a full century, as this tree became the focal point of a war for survival, a war among countless nations and races as the rest of the world sank beneath the waves, with everyone vying to claim this safe haven as their own. The Adam Tree became known as the Tree of an Island of Never-Ending War, and Elbaf became known as Warland. And it all comes together when you realize that the proof of all of this is precisely in who ultimately lives in Elbaf today. The giants, the mightiest race, the strongest nation in existence. Because ultimately in this war around the Adam Tree in the Void Century, with all the nations and races battling over this coveted land that everyone so desperately desired, the group who finally came away with it in their possession would naturally have been the strongest group, the ones who came out on top and the giants are the strongest. The simple fact that the clear most valuable land on the planet also just so happens to be held by the strongest and mightiest race is the most damning evidence for the land having been won through force, through war. This would also explain why the giants today worship war so much. They survived a mass extinction precisely because of winning a seemingly never-ending war. They owe everything they have to war. They look to their war god as benevolent and just. They believe that he gives victory to those that are deserving precisely because it is through war that they were able to claim their home, their land, and the continuation of their race. After such a hard-fought survival, of course war would become an important, revered part of the giants' culture for centuries onwards, even if they stopped actually waging war with other nations and their own internal civilization became relatively stable. All of this even further ties into the fact that the Yggdrasil tree of Norse mythology is mirrored by the Elbaf tree, as it strongly suggests that there may be a hell layer of Elbaf buried at the bottom, holding the bloody secrets of the war from the past, an idea first suggested by my viewer Varun. Though you can get my extended explanation of that in my weekly podcast that just dropped by becoming a member below or by supporting me on Patreon, link in the description below. So let's look at all the facts from the top. When the Great Flooding began, we know every nation and race would fight to claim safe land, that is clearly established. The Great Adam Tree and its surrounding land would have obviously stood out as the safest land in existence. And so a bloody war would have started there, and likely raged for the full void century with no one willing to concede the most valuable safe haven on the ocean. That is why the land became known as Warland. As it was quite likely the world's first great territory war, this is also why it became known as the birthplace of war. And this is also why the Great Adam Tree became known for having endured a great, seemingly endless war. And today, Elbaf is in the hands of the giants, the strongest nation in existence, precisely because in the end, the strongest nation would naturally have been the one to win the war and ultimately claim this valuable piece of land as their own. And finally, this is why today we see that this race of giants, the victors of the war, place war on a pedestal, as according to them, divine judgment determines that the righteous will win war. And the bloody truth of the Void Century land wars over safe ground becomes even more apparent when you begin to expand this thinking a bit further to what we know of the entire world of One Piece today. In a world that is in danger of sinking beneath the waves, the safest and most valuable land doesn't just coincidentally happen to end up in the hands of the strongest. It is in the hands of the strongest precisely because it is the safest and most valuable. That is why there is in fact an exact correlation between the strength of a faction and the land that they have claimed. Because if we're being very technical, Technical, Elbaf isn't technically the strongest faction and the Adam Tree isn't technically the safest haven. The Celestial Dragons are the true strongest faction and that's why they have the Red Line, as it's the true safest haven. Even the Eve Tree, the Adam Tree's only counterpart, is part of the Red Line and in possession of the Celestial Dragons. So the absolute most powerful faction, the 20 Allied Kingdoms, aka the Celestial Dragons, they claim the Red Line from the start and along with it, of course, the Eve Tree. But no other factions could really challenge the 20 Allied Kingdoms to take the Red Line from from them, meaning all the other nations and races in the world had to fight over the second best spot, the Adam Tree. And the Giants were ultimately the second strongest faction after the Celestial Dragons, and so they won the Adam Tree in the end. And what's the third safest island in the One Piece world that is guaranteed to survive flooding? Can you think of a nation that is, say, elevated far above sea level such that you have to climb up a giant waterfall to get to it? 
That's right, Wano is the next safest haven on the ocean after the Atom Tree. And would you look at that, the Wano Samurai are the next strongest nation in the world after the Elbaf Giants. Elbaf and Wano are in fact the only two nations in the world today so powerful that the world government has to leave them alone. Power correlates to possession. In a war for safe ground 800 years ago, everything that would have followed is simple, logical, brutal hierarchy of power. The 20 allied kingdoms are the strongest and they claim first place, the most valuable ground, highest above sea level, the red line. The Elbaf giants are the next strongest group, they won the next best spot, the Adam Tree, and created the nation of Elbaf. The group that we know today as the Samurai were the third strongest faction and so they claim the third most valuable region, which is now known as Wano. These are the only three true safe havens on the entire Blue Seas. The rest of the land across the globe ended up being claimed by all the other struggling nations and races that took whatever they could get that was left. But all of this remaining land is precarious and fleeting. All the other islands are basically barely above sea level. And it's been established that all it would take is a mere five more meters of flooding, just a handful more uses of the ancient weapon for every other island aside from Elbaf and Wano to sink beneath the waves. This also leads me to the other striking clear parallel between Elbaf and Wano, which is the gigantic swords in both locations. As aside from the red line itself, these two locations likely would have been epicenters of huge wars. So notice that both of these nations also feature the remnants of mighty warriors, who were gigantic far beyond comprehension. Only Elbath and Wano feature remnants of war this striking. Could this mean that there were powerful giant ancient beings in that era that would naturally have been fighting at the epicenters of war in the Void Century? Could these be the results of Devil Fruits enlarging individual size, as I speculate on in this video? Either way, there are clearly deliberate similarities between Elbaf and Wano in that they both stand out as the safest regions from flooding. They are both held by the two strongest nations in the world today, and they both show the remnants of extraordinary warriors having fought there in the past. Everything in the narrative points to a battle for safe ground having taken place in the Void Century with the strongest claiming the best land. Because the Red Line was already claimed by the 20 allied kingdoms, the Atom Tree turned into the ultimate war zone as all races and nations converged around it. It became known as the birthplace of war between between all people in the world. The victors were the giants, the strongest race who hold Elbaf to this day, and base their entire culture around reverence for war, because war gave them everything they have. And herein lies the final problem for the giants. The giants may have won Elbaf for themselves 800 years ago, but another war for safe ground is coming. And this time, every other island in the world is likely to be sunk, meaning soon, it's possible that Elbaf and only Elbaf will remain as the last piece of driftwood on an endless expanse of blue. Readers have talked for ages about the ties between the Elbaf Ark and Ragnarok. Elbaf is strongly inspired from Norse mythology after all, and Norse mythology revolves around the idea of one final war to end all wars. Ragnarok, the end and rebirth of the world. We know that Oda himself loves Norse and Viking mythology, with Vicky the Viking having been one of the inspirations for One Piece itself. Whatever Oda has been planning for the Elbaf Ark may be far grander than anything we may have imagined, because so far literally everything in One Piece has been careening towards this Ragnarok-esque final war to end all wars and the dawn of a new world. From Doflamingo's speech to Vegapunk's speech to Kaido's proclamation to Dragon's proclamation, we are being told over and over that the end times are coming and the death of the old world and the birth of the new is going to happen. Is that why we are here in Elbaf of all places in the final saga, an island inspired by Norse mythology that just so happens to be centered around the theme of war? All of it to make this the centerpiece of the beginning of Ragnarok, the war to end all wars. Is that why right before this arc started, Oda established that all it would take is five more meters of flooding and every every island will drown? Is that why he established that the war for safe ground is about to begin? Is that why Oda designed Elbaf to be the one safe haven on the globe that would be able to clearly survive such a flooding? The ultimate, most coveted safe ground in existence. Is all of this lead up for Elbaf to once again turn into Warland, as all eyes across the globe turn towards the one safe haven that will remain on the planet as the sea levels rise? And with all this emphasis on death and rebirth, if Elbaf is where the original world war began, if it is the birthplace of war, is it also meant to be where the war that ends all wars kicks off? I believe that Ragnarok is coming, and that Elbaf's setting was specifically designed for this island to be where Ragnarok begins. The giants won this land 800 years ago because they were the strongest. But today is different than back then, as back then there was still enough land left that nations and races could retreat to the small remaining islands after they failed to claim Elbaf. But today it's been made clear that there will be no land left soon. Elbaf and perhaps Wano are the only known islands with enough height to survive this flooding. 
Wano, however, has natural barriers that would make it impossible for nations to approach it, but Elbaf is open season. The only barrier that exists to Elbaf is the strength of the giants themselves. And while their strength has been the perfect deterrent for centuries, that will not be the case when every single nation's only option is death or attempting to lay siege to the nation of the giants. And if you doubt that Elbaf will become a war zone again, if you doubt that the battle for safe ground is coming, and that Elbaf will stand out as the only viable option for survival, Consider this, there is still no clear conflict in the Elbaf arc. The entire story has been building up to Elbaf for so long, but we have entered the island with the actual storyline somehow still being mysteriously a complete blank slate. We don't even know if Loki is the main villain. Even if he is extraordinarily strong, he still has no crew or subordinates, so it's hard to imagine the entire Elbaf storyline being about defeating him. That's why it's been so long speculated that the true conflict for the Elbaf arc will come from outside. The only question has been who? And the simple answer might be everyone. Everyone will want Elbaf because soon there will be no options left but Elbaf. So let me know how you believe Ragnarok will begin in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then definitely like and subscribe. And if you want to hear my extended thoughts on how we may explore the final layer of Elbaf at the bottom of the tree, you can listen to my weekly podcast that just dropped by becoming a member on YouTube or by supporting me on Patreon. Link in the description below.